Welcome into episode three of Oh Mama, a look back at the 2008 Steel Curtain defense brought to you by South Hills Kia. I'm your host, Chris Mack. Hope you enjoyed the first two episodes starring one of the architects of those great defenses of Super Bowl 40, Super Bowl 43, and just generally the early 2000s for the Pittsburgh Steelers, Dick LeBeau. Episode one, in case you missed it, go back and check it out. Went back on Coach LeBeau growing up in Ohio, just outside of Columbus, going to Ohio State, being cut by the Cleveland Browns in training camp, catching on with the Detroit Lions, and the rest of his playing career leading up to the beginnings of his coaching career, really. Episode two, in case you missed that, again, available on 93.7 The Fan's YouTube page, as well as in your Odyssey app under 93.7 The Fan On Demand, uh, touched on what it was like for Coach LeBeau, sort of turning the page from Bill Cowher to Mike Tomlin and those great defenses of 2008 and beyond. Again, anytime you want to listen to them, inside your Odyssey app, A-U-D-A-C-Y, it's free. Download it today. Go to 93.7 The Fan and search On Demand or watch them right here on our YouTube page at 93.7thefan.com. But it was great to have a chance to catch up with one of the unsung heroes, in my opinion, of the 2005 and 2008 Super Bowl teams, Bryant McFadden. Bryant, thank you so much for taking the time to jump in and talk to us about what was a legendary defense and one year in particular for that defense in 2008. A great opportunity uh, to talk about that story run for us in 2008 and for the Pittsburgh Steelers and just for the fans in totality, man, everybody get an opportunity to enjoy that moment. If you were old enough to remember everything that we went through to get to that level to hoist the sixth Lombardi, remember we were the first organization ever in the National Football League right. to win six championships. So just being a part of that, man, is a blessing, man, uh, yet to uh, yet uh, to this day. Yeah, and, and, and I wanted to, you talk about how it came together, BMAC, and I kind of want to start there. I want to start with 2005, and you get drafted, you come in, you start contributing early on, right? And everybody remembers, I think, at least, again, those of us of a certain age, we remember that game in Indy and the Jerome Bettis fumble, right? And Oh, man, everybody's heart sink, and we think, here comes Peyton Manning, Marvin Harrison. But twice, Peyton Manning tries going to Reggie Wayne in the end zone. Big plays you make as a rookie in just your second playoff game. And I'm just, it, what were your first impressions, first of all, before we get to that postseason run in 2005, your first impressions, you get drafted by the Steelers, you come in, there's this legacy involved, this aura around the Pittsburgh Steelers, and you show up to St. Vincent College in Latrobe for the first time, and you meet Coach LeBeau. Um, what was your, what was your initial I guess, uh, takeaway from mm. walking in to becoming a Pittsburgh Steeler that rookie year? Yo, my initial takeaway instantly was I was around grown men. <laughs> like grown men on and off the football field. And the reason why I say that, I just monitored how they went about their routines, their daily routines, and how they took care of their bodies, how they came together outside of the facility and then outside of noticing that, I realized this was a team that had redemption on their mind, had a, a revenge on their mind. Because what we cannot forget is in 2004, the Pittsburgh Steelers were one of the best teams, not just in the AFC, but in the entire NFL. Mm -hmm. And their season came to a halt in the playoffs against the New England Patriots. And of course, the Patriots went on to win another Super Bowl against Philadelphia Eagles. But many people felt like Pittsburgh should have gotten to Absolutely. Jacksonville to that Super Bowl. And now, yeah. of course, you want to throw in Spygate. That's another mm -hmm. topic of discussion. <laughs> That's a whole other but podcast. <laughs> exactly, right, Chris? But when I got drafted, the guys that were already there that were a part of that 04 run, they had they had get back on their mind. I mean, they were like, yo, we, 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 we were the better team, we felt like, for the entire season, for 90% of the season, we were the be better team. We did not finish the drill. Now it's about getting to that moment again, but most importantly, finishing the drill. So that was a well-assembled team. And some of the guys that we brought in, you know, Cedric Wilson, look at, look at my draft class, you know, Heath Miller, uh, myself, Trey Essence, um, Nate Washington, you know, Ar Ar look at the free agents that made the team. Arnold Harrison, um, right. Andre Frazier, 
Uh, we had Ryan Wallace also. We had my rookie class at some point throughout 2005. We all contributed to, to, to some degree, either draft picks or free agents. John Kuhn, you know what I mean? So uh, uh, Greg Warren, who was a long time, long snapper for us. Uh, Chris Kimoatu, uh, please, man, if, if Sean O'Hare, if I forget a name, I apologize. But just how we went about our business and just kind of gravitating to all the, the vets, man, that was that was a season of redemption, to say the least. And luckily enough, they, we were able to get that said redemption. What, what's interesting, BMAC, is you bring up the idea of instant contributors. I want to circle back to that uh, as it relates to 2008, the year we're specifically talking about, in just a couple of minutes. But let's you you go through that postseason run, that magical postseason run to Super Bowl 40. Coach Cower gets his ring. Um, and then things kind of break up over the next year or two, to a certain extent. The core stays together, but, you know. Joey Porter moves on to Miami. Chris Hope goes to Nashville. Mike Logan, I think, retires. Mm -hmm. Who else? Willie Williams was actually a, a part of that 2005 yes, team at the yes. age of like 35, 36. He retires. Um, what did that 2005 team, though, with so many of you sticking around through the next couple of years, do to build a foundation for 2008? That's the thing, Chris. The foundation was already built. All we did, we just added more pieces to the house. Right. We had a basement. You know, we had a great first level, great top level. We just added a patio on the back <laughs> with a with a with a cover over it to, to provide more equity right. well, into the home. Ryan Clark and James Harrison are a pretty nice patio. They're a pretty nice Facts. deck to add on to the Lamar back of the house. Whitley. Lamar right. Whitley. Right. Right. You know, Lawrence Timmons, yes. San Antonio Holmes. Mm -hmm. You know, those are guys that were not a part of the 05 run that became big time contributors for the 08 run and that's what i'm talking about just adding pieces to the foundation to the home that was already built established in circa 2005 and not just adding on but a new owner to the house too if you want to call it that mike tomlin comes in and takes over for it's, bill cower right exactly another piece that made the the equity in the home just increased dramatically. skyrocket yeah so yes. what was what was the relationship like because you guys have this established d right you've got the foundation like you talk about a couple pieces move in and out. We talk about Ryan Clark, James Harrison, a bunch of 2007 draft picks who we'll get to more specifically in a couple minutes. But most importantly, the head coach walks in. And yeah. he's this young, effervescent, energetic, defense first coach. What was it like to watch Mike Tomlin walk in? How did he immediately command the respect of such a veteran group? And mm -hmm. I guess a lot of people remember as well. How did Dick LeBeau and maybe Keith Butler play a role in that as well? Well, I think... For us to get to 2008, we have to highlight 2007, which was Mike's T first year rookie mm -hmm. as a rookie head coach. Remember, we were basically a year removed from winning the Super Bowl in 05. Missed the playoffs by, by the hair of our chin in 2006. And we were disappointed because we felt like we had, a, we had enough to make another run. But we remember Ben was missing the first few ball games of the season. We, we, right. we had a losing streak. Beat Cincinnati in the final game, but things didn't work out in our favor. In comes Mike Tomlin. Now, he's a young coach. We were a, an established team with leaders, but Mike Tomlin attacked that coaching opportunity like we were a young team. People don't remember this, but in 2007, we had 20 straight days of two days. Straight. Man. And that was something that wasn't a rule throughout the NFL, that was something that Mike Tomlin was doing because he wanted to see who can handle that type of pressure and who was going to break. Right Now, like I said, we had a great group of leaders, experienced leaders. So for us mentally, we're like, man, coach, we don't have to go through this gauntlet because we know how to get it done, but we're going to do it. But it took a lot out of us. Now, in yeah. comes 2008, training camp, he attacked training camp differently. So 2007 was more about learning on the curve on the right. curve and then finding out how I can handle these guys moving forward. In 08, he knew what he had. So that training camp in Latrobe was night and day in regards to the training camp in 2007 and how we went about our business, how we attacked the field and how he allowed moments to kind of recalibrate ourselves mentally and physically to go out to give our best effort. Because in 2007, we died down. When we played right. Jacksonville in that playoff game, we had nothing left in the tank. 
So we were tired. You, you get to July of 2008 now, right? And yep. you're all reporting to St. Vincent and Latrobe. And it's, you know, all this, a lot of the same faces, right? Uh, James Harrison is starting to grow into that monster that he would become on the field. You got Mr. Mr.'s consistency, I guess, Farrier and Foot next to each other on the inside. Troy's still there, obviously. We talked about the addition of Ryan Clark. You've got a bunch of rookies now from the 2007 draft class. Will Gay, Lamar Woodley, Lawrence Timmons, who have a year of experience under their belt. What was the feeling walking into camp that summer? And as you got ready for the season, was there, you know, great teams often look back and say, man, there was something different about the origin point of that season or that that run that we went on. Mm. Was the, the, there the way that we realization? Walked, yeah, the way we walked into 08 training camp in Latrobe, s- similar to what we had in 05, redemption, because of how the season ended in 07. We felt like we were a good team. We just didn't have a lot left in the tank. And then we also felt disrespected mm. because if you look at how the rankings were put out from the consensus of analysts and media outlets, many people felt like we would finish either third or fourth in our division. Because number one of our schedule, we had the most difficult, we had the right. toughest schedule in the National Football League. Number two, how some of the teams in our division finished. Remember in 07, the Cleveland Browns won 10, 10 games, right? right? They had a, a handful of pro bowlers. Uh, Derek Anderson, remember, was the quarterback. Many people felt like the Browns would take that next step and be consistent. And of course, Cincinnati was doing some pretty good things in Baltimore. So a lot of people felt like, man, Best case scenario for Pittsburgh, they may finish third, but we feel mm-hmm. like they potentially will finish fourth when you look at their division gauntlet and the regular season schedule. So we were we were pissed off. We were yeah. ticked off. So we put all of that together and went into training camp, man, with, yo, we, we, we were being disrespected. Motivation is already there for us, but now we have extra motivation because people are forgetting who we are as an organization and who we are as a ball club. And last year, things didn't work out well. Not to mention Mike Tomlin, attack coaching in year two much differently than he did in year one and that helped all parties involved so you guys come out a house on fire in 2008 right you start four and one at the bye you win out of the bye five and one you're six and three you're giving up like 14 points a game on defense then you slam on the gas even more right last seven games of the season you're six and one you give up like 83 points like 12 points a game holding opponents to less than 14, less than 14 in all six victories. You wrap up big 31, nothing shutout route of Cleveland in week 17. So what do you remember about that regular season Uh and, and how were guys feeling going into the playoffs now that you've been able to sort of push back against all the misconceptions, all the preseason perceptions and you're 12 and four and your AFC North champs, man, we, we were so confident. Um, our entire team was confident, but on the defensive side, Chris, you just you just read off the numbers. Remember also another stat that does not get talked about enough, in my opinion. We became the first team and only team to this day in the National Football League to hold 13 straight opponents offensively to under 300 yards. Mm-hmm. Think about how difficult that is to do. Never going to happen again. Yeah. The toughest schedule in the National Football League, some of the quarterbacks and the offenses we were playing against. We held 13 straight teams. Under 300 yards total, not to mention all the statistics that we finished number one in. I mean, scoring, pass defense. We only allowed like 157 yards through the air, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. I mean, I, seven, 17 turnovers too, BMAC. Like, that's the kind of stuff that, you know, that, that's an opportunistic mindset that I think existed not just up front, you know, James Harrison going for strip sacks on quarterbacks, not just in the middle of the field, not just on the edges. That's every single guy, all 14, 15, 16 guys who are in the rotation on a Sunday going into it with the mindset. I'm I'm not just looking to maintain and stop the opposition. I'm looking to take the game to them. Yes. Make what Mike T T had started to call then splash plays. Right. and, And two things that made our defense extremely good in regards to the numbers that we were able to put up, Chris, two things. We tackled extremely well. Mm. We did not miss a lot of tackles. Guys in the secondary, second level, first level, we tackled well. Tackling for us was something we wanted to do. We didn't do it because we had to, because we played defense. We wanted to tackle. And whenever we tackled, we made sure we got you down. If we didn't, you had 10 other guys coming swarm. with yeah. their hair on fire. And outside of tackling, how well we tackled, we did not allow a lot of big plays. Right. Coach Lebo used to always tell us in the secondary, if you keep everything in front of you, you will win more than you will lose. 
We did not allow a lot of big plays. And one thing that I think was a, a real cool moment for us, an eye-opening moment for us, Chris, was December, late December. Mm -hmm. We're real rolling. Like you said, we were just beating people up, winning ball games. <laughs> we go down to Tennessee. Yeah. And you remember Tennessee, the Titans, they, 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 they beat us real bad. Yeah. That moment was something we needed. We didn't know at the time, but we needed it because we were playing so, 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 our football was so good that our confidence was sky high. We felt like, man, there's nothing nobody can do to slow us down. But then we got some humble pie. We were forced to eat that humble pie. We digested. it. Right. We looked at what happened to allow that humble pie to be a reality. And we went right back to the drawing board and say, you know what? We're not as good as we thought we are. We are vulnerable in some moments, in, in some places. Well, so that points. made us go back to recalibrate everything that we put together and say, you know what, for us to get to where we're trying to go, there are some things we got to fine tune. And those poor Cleveland Browns paid the price for it. Like I Facts. said, in week 17, they Facts. got shut out right after that Tennessee game. I want to yeah. go back because we brought it up a couple of times. Let me go back to those, those rookies from 2007. Cause you talked about how there was the, the slew of additions in your draft class, right. That made a huge impact on the Super Bowl 40 team. Super Bowl 43 team was impacted by guys drafted the year prior. Lawrence Timmons, first round pick, 2007, 65 tackles in 2008. Lamar Woodley, second round pick, 2007, 11 and a half sacks. I think two forced fumbles as well in 2008. Willie Gay, fifth round pick in 2007, seven pass breakups in just four starts. So all these young guys come in, have this enormous impact like you and your draft class did in 2005. How did they fold atmospherically into the room and into the group? Um, were, was there a paying of dues? Was there how, how did that work and what was already, we've already talked about, such an established group of guys? Well, for them, it was similar to what my rookie class went through. We meshed in easily because we saw what the older guys were doing. And for us, to do what we need to do, we have to follow their footsteps because they were doing things the right way, taking care of their body. Going to the facility on Tuesday, which is your off day to get a workout. When no one is forcing you to do so, you go get a workout, you start your early film prep for the upcoming ball game. That's what those guys did. And that's the unique thing we had in Pittsburgh at that time was the leadership was so concrete that as a young guy, if you want to be successful in this locker room, it's imperative for you to find a vet and follow those vets that are in your position groups. Right. And that's what they did. Because you talked about Lamar Woodley. Lamar Woodley goes into a situation where, yeah, Joey Porter is no longer there, but James Harrison is there, mm -hmm. right? Lawrence Timmons goes, goes into a situation where you got James Ferrier, Larry Foote. Will Gay goes into a situation where you, you still got Deshae Townsend. You got Ike Taylor. Right. You got myself. You got guys that have done it the right way, and they know how to do it. So it was easy to see young fellas jump in and then follow suit. Look at Santonio. He goes into a situation where you got – Heinz Ward. Nate Washington goes into a situation where you got Randall L. Heinz Ward. You know what I mean? Heath mm -hmm. Miller. You got Jeremy uh, Truman and guys like that. So that was the building block for what we were able to accomplish. And that four year stretch winning two Super Bowls was sound leadership, sound leadership, where those leaders didn't mind showing the young fellas, even though we play the same position, I'm going to show you how right. to win. I bring and you I don't along. see you as yeah. a threat. I'm trying to build you to become an asset for all of us. Did that trickle down from Dick LeBeau at all? Or was that just, I, I mean, I, I guess it sounds like it bubbled up more from within guys that they wanted to filter it out to the young ones coming in, like you said. But did, did that get reinforced organizationally at all by Mike T, by Dick no, LeBeau? No, Bill Cower, Mike Tomlin, Dick LeBeau, mm -hmm. Bruce Arians. No, it wasn't reinforced. It was just to steal away. Mm -hmm. One thing about our organization we drafted like mind players, selfless guys that are hard workers, didn't care about the spotlight. Our right. slogan on our team was one person make a play. We all make a play because we are all going to celebrate because we all have our mind on one co common goal, trying to win a championship. So we don't have time to, to be mad because I didn't make a play this game, but we won. No, man, we all make a play. Think about when you saw Troy with these highlights. We weren't yeah. mad because Troy was always making the plays. We were happy because that's a part of us because we're all in it for the same reason. And Dick LeBose tells us all the time, it might not be your time to shine this game, but your time is coming. And when it comes, be ready. 
be ready. So we had a selfish group of guys. The NFL is all about winning, but then you have a bunch of individuals that act as individuals. Mm. We didn't do that in Pittsburgh. So it was easy for me to be an up and coming corner and we draft Willie Gay and hey man, Will, this is how we do things. Because guess what? My Ricky and 05 guys I were competing against, competing against and the Shea and Ike and Willie, they took me right there next to them and showed me the way. So what type of individual would I be to say, man, nah, we, we play the same position. I can't talk to you like that. No, right. that's, not, that's not how we do things here. That's the, the culture was set before I got there. I just gravitated and meshed into the culture and I continue to do what the culture did for me for the younger guys that were coming up behind me. That was a steal away. So let me get to the playoff run of 2008 now. You guys start off at home against the Chargers, down 10 nothing late second quarter, but the old double tap, touchdowns on the last possession of the second quarter and the first possession of the third quarter, kind of take over the game from there, trade a couple late TDs, but ultimately you hold off Phil Rivers. Then the AFC Championship game, Baltimore Ravens. I mean, this is the game, I think, from the last 30 years that best defines the AFC North and what it's all about. You guys jump out to a 13 nothing lead, but the Ravens, Flacco, scratch and fight and claw back. It's 16-14 with nine and a half minutes left. You guys are up. About 6.50 left on the clock, just under seven minutes. And all of a sudden, you know that feeling because it's happened how many times at Heinz Field? Oh, mama, I'm in fear yeah, for yes, my sir. life. Oh, yeah. Oh. What is it like to be on the field when that hits? Yo, it feels like I can run into a mountain and I can move the mountain. <laughs> That's what it feels like. We, we, we feel sorry for the offense we're going against when that momentum has shifted in our favor and they play that. They play that renegade, renegade on the big screen and the state in the stadium, the stadium just going crazy. It's cold outside. Yeah. You see nothing but smoke coming from everybody's face masks. And you just see it. Then you start seeing the hits on the big screen. And for mm. us, we got to try to do a good job in not getting too hyped. Right. Because we still got to go out here and play football. <laughs> like the way the fans feel in the stadium, we feel like that times 10. But, yo, we still got to go out and do our job. So you don't want to use too much energy watching the highlights getting caught in the moment because you still got to go out and slow this offense down. But that moment right there, those are the Pittsburgh things, man. Yeah. Uh, there's, there's things about Pittsburgh, the city, the team, that's just iconic. And it only is for Pittsburgh. Think about when you drive into the city, you go through the tunnel. It's dark. Just leading up to the tunnel, it seems such a, like a rural environment. Not a lot right. going on. You get in the tunnel. Then as soon as you get out of the tunnel, Bang. you see the city. Yep. You see the city, especially at night, the mm. city, the nice skyline. And then you look to your left, you see the stadium, right, where legends were born in that stadium. Because clearly, that's not Three Rivers, but Three Rivers was right there in that area, in that yep. area as well. And then you talk about that. And then, of course, all the highlights, all the moments that happened in Three Rivers that happened there. I still call it Heinz Field. I know it's not Heinz yeah. Field anymore. It's all right. I apologize. It's still Heinz Field to us. That's good. Yeah. But and then and that, that just that renegade, man, that's it. No, no other organization could play that. No, no university could play that. That's that's a Pittsburgh thing, man. And when we hear it, my blood, man, my blood still boils to this still get, day. Still get the goosebumps, right? Oh, my goodness, man. <laughs> just hearing you just now, <laughs> giving us a little snippet, man, gets me boiling, my blood boiling. So it's the AFC Championship game. And like you said, it's that exact imagery that you just used. You see everybody's steam coming out of their face mask. The place is going nuts. You're up two points on your arch rivals, your nemesis, with a trip to the Super Bowl on the line. Five plays later, the Troy pick six. And I, I've never, Brian, I've been to a lot of sporting events. I to And I'm not the only person that says this. To a person, when you ask people who were there that night, and everybody claims to have been there that night now, but the actual 58, 59, 60,000 people who were there that night all say it is the loudest they've ever heard that place. What did it feel like down at field level as you watch Troy pick off Joe Flacco and run it back 40 plus yards for what at that point feels like the clinching and did end up being the AFC championship game clinching touchdown. Literally the stadium was shaking. 
if the stands were, were moving. That probably was the loudest moment I ever heard Heinz Field get. It was unbelievable because number one, like you said, we're up to game away from the Super Bowl against our rivals, having the opportunity to beat them three times in one year. Mm -hmm. They're backed up. Not only did we get a turnover, but we put points on the scoreboard. When that happened, game over. How much time was left at that moment? Do you remember, Chris? I want to say it's about four something. It's about yeah. four it and change, time. about four and a half. So, yeah, yeah, that's the thing. And I remember Jim Nance's call. You obviously didn't hear it. You're down on, on the field at this point in time. But Jim Nance on CBS kind of puts a, a punctuation mark, kind of sticks a flag in the ground and says, and, and, you know, uh, the, the Pittsburgh Steelers kind of alludes to the fact that the Steelers are going to the Super Bowl. And I remember, you know, you look back on it now, he's absolutely right. He called it. But at, in that moment in time, you look up at the clock and you go, mm. you know, Flacco kind of had that reputation mm -hmm. even then of being a guy who might be able to bring him back. And yeah, we're up by nine now, but there's about four minutes left or so. And actually what happens in the immediate aftermath of that, because the Ravens get the ball right back after the yeah. kickoff is two plays later. I think Todd Heap catches a ball for like eight yards, maybe next play Willis McGahee has the ball in his hands, turns up field, and he and Ryan Clark just explode. And I talk mm. about moments within moments that define AFC North football. That moment, it's scary at that point in time, certainly I'm sure for Willis McGahee and even for Ryan Clark. And But now you look back on it, that is the, the moment that defines Steelers-Ravens and what it has become about over the last quarter century. Another point where you're down there at field level, what are you thinking when you see that? It sounded like a cannon. It was like, it's like, oh, shoot. And if yeah. you look back at that highlight, that play, when Willis fumbled, because it was a fumble, mm -hmm. the guys that were around the football, and I was coming up also because I was on the left side, I didn't even think to go for the ball. I was like, oh, yeah. shoot, I need to go to the bodies that's laying down right now. Yeah. Because I, I knew Willis from my high school days. And then, of course, he went to Miami. I went to Florida State. And Ryan's my team. I'm like, oh, shoot. Yeah. What the freak just happened? And I think eventually Lawrence Simmons got on the fumble. Yes. I think he recovered the mm -hmm. fumble eventually. But for us, it was like, forget the ball. Man, we got two guys out laid out. And we don't know what is going to happen right. after this. Because it was that type of impact. But Ryan Clark was such a student of the game. We were in two man. And for Ryan Clark to make this play as a two-man safety tells you he was dialed in before the play was in motion mm -hmm. based on the formation. Because being a two-man safety, you're basically like a two-high safety. You're right. deep and you have a half of the field. For Ryan Clark to make that play from the depth in which he was positioned at in the beginning, he knew what was coming. And if you watch Ryan Clark, if you can see the all-22 cut-up of that play, he had a beeline straight to Willis McGahee. So what happened was the Baltimore Ravens needing to, to capitalize on a big play. Our first playoff game that year, the, the week before, was against the Chargers, mm -hmm. right? And if you remember the Chargers late in that ball game, Darren Sproles caught a pass out of the backfield and split yep. the middle of our defense. It was like an F-angle route. F-angle route, Chris, is basically... Running back, he could be offset to the quarterback's left side. He's going to sprint at an angle and then cut across the, the face of the linebacker right in front of the, the, the interior of the offensive line. Okay. Philip Rivers hit Darren Sproles. He split us. Mm -hmm. I think he scored, if I'm not mistaken. That's right? Right. Baltimore was setting up to do the same thing because they knew at that time our run linebackers was a little aggressive. Mm -hmm. And if that running back sp sprinted, out of the backfield at an angle, they knew our linebacks were going to try to be aggressive to go get either that out route and they will be vulnerable to that angle route once the running back crosses the face of the backer. And if we look at it, the same thing happened. Willis McGahee caught the ball in stride. Mm -hmm. But Ryan Clark dissecting the play before it happened, he knew that was the same play the Chargers ran and we got gave up a big play. And he was like, that's not going to happen. So what Ryan Clark did was he saw the formation pre-snap alignment and when the ball was in motion, he ran straight. He ran now. So that's how he was able to make the impact he was able to make on Willis because he knew what was happening. And the rest is history. But that's yeah. great film study and just being a student of the game because even though we felt like the game was over, 
Baltimore still had more than a fighting chance left. Right. And, and that's amazing. I hadn't put two and two together, BMAC, that you did. You got burned by Sproles the week mm -hmm. before. Um, and that's a very similar, if not the exact same play. The same exact play. Same route. Same play call for both the offense and our defense. They ran the same play the Chargers ran. We were running the same play defensively that we ran against the Chargers that gave up that play. So for Baltimore, they're like, okay, we just gave up we a big it. play, yeah. but we got what we want. And we got RC, it. RC steps up and shuts it down and oh, provides yes. another one of those moments. So you get out of you get out of it alive, which is an accomplishment against the Ravens in any Steelers Ravens game of that generation. And you head down to Tampa, Super Bowl 43, and you're going up against Larry Fitz, Anquan Bolden. Steve Breston had a great year that year. Edrin oh, James. Three wide receivers that had a thousand yards, by the way. Yes, Edrin James that year. Uh, Kurt Warner, Hall of Fame quarterback. You're going into that game. What's your mindset, and how did the experience of three years prior to that help you guys perhaps, I don't know, establish that emotional and energetic baseline through what's a long buildup? We went into that ball game seeing the Arizona Cardinals similar to what we did in 05, right? They were up and down the entire regular season, but in the mm -hmm. playoffs, they became a different team. That offense was explosive. They had an opportunistic defense. They just started playing some of their best football in the postseason. And we did the same thing similar in 05. We played some of our best football in the postseason. And then offensively for us, we like, yo, their offense is very, very explosive. Kurt Warner, Hall of Famer. Edron James, even though he was at the end of his career, still was productive, Hall of mm -hmm. Famer. Larry Fitzgerald will get into the Hall, first ballot. And Quan Bolden, at some point in time, I believe he will get into the Hall. So you're talking about four guys, when it's all said and done, that will be in the Hall of Fame. And like I said, they had three wide receivers that surpassed 1,000 yards. That doesn't happen, right? So we felt like this is a team that's coming into this ball game, regardless of how they finish the regular season, they believe they're good enough to win. Right. So for us, being for most of our players, this was their second go around going to the Super Bowl. We wanted to use that to our advantage and how to prioritize the week of prep. So we're good to go for Sunday because mm -hmm. we went through it before. And people ask me all the time, Chris, how can you explain playing in the Super Bowl the first time and then playing in the, the Super Bowl the right. second or third time? The best way I can explain this for anyone who's ever been on a roller coaster, the very first time you go on a massive roller coaster, you don't know when to brace some of the, the drops, the, cur right. the turns and the curves and the ups and the downs. So that first time you go through, you're going to be really, really shook in moments of that experience. But if you go on that very same roller coaster again, you kind of know when to brace right. for some of the, 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 the drops and the turns and the ups and the downs. Same thing for Super Bowl. The first time you don't know how to handle the accommodations for everybody. You don't know how to handle so many people wanting tickets. Someone, so many people want to be associated with the game. You don't know how to prioritize. All right, when do I handle this off the field activity? When do I handle this off the, right. off the field activity? Or how should I handle it? That's how it was, was our rookie at No. 05. We didn't know how to handle certain things and how to embrace the wave of requests. Mm -hmm. And you don't want to seem like the bag all the time, but hey, you got to sure. be. The second go around, we kind of knew how to navigate. We knew when we were getting there. We knew how the workout regiment would be. We knew because when we got to Detroit, the first day we got there, the first thing we did was we were like, let's all go to the facility so we can kind of see where the facility is, where things will be, training room, weight room. So now the next day when we get there, we're not wasting any time. Right. We did the same thing in Tampa. When we got to Tampa, we went straight to South Florida. That's where we were training at, practicing at. Got accommodated to our lockers, making sure everything was in our locker that we need for practice, weight room, some of the guys got to lift. So now we're off and running. We got an extra day because usually when you get there, you want to try to get accommodated as soon as possible. We did that right. on the day we arrived. So that's the best way for us in regards to being more adjusted that 05 Super Bowl helped us for 08. So you get to the game and it's late first half. It's it, Arizona's about to go in and go up on you yeah. guys. Yeah. One yard line. We all know the play. James Harrison drops into coverage instead of going on the blitz, instead of pass rushing as he's supposed to. Um, picks off Kurt Warner, starts heading downfield. And at first, I think we're all watching, at least those of us at home or those in the stands watching, go, okay, well, he, they're going to run him into the sidelines. He's going to go out of bounds about the 40, 45, and that's going to be that. But 
Then the then the cavalry shows up. The Shays out there, Kiesel's out there, Woodley's out there, and you start to think, oh my God, he might he might be able to do this. James might not run out of steam here, and he doesn't until the very end as he's literally falling over the goal line. What's happening as everybody's standing there watching this? What are you thinking? What's everyone? How's everyone around you reacting? I number one, the play call offensively for Arizona was the best play call. Mm -hmm. But James Harrison, that is the one time you're you don't you're good to do what you're not supposed to do. Yeah. He wasn't supposed to be there, as you've all heard. He was supposed to be blitzing. Because if he blitzed, they were running a pick route, similar to the Malcolm Butler interception against the Seahawks in the Super Bowl. Mm -hmm. And the position for Deshae, it, it was going to be impossible. I think it was Deshae to get there because of the pick was going to happen. So when James Harrison caught the pass, we went from, oh, yes, turnover in the red zone. Great. Then you started seeing the return established. So one thing that allowed that return to be a reality on Sunday for all you guys that saw it was the week of preparation. I think it was that Wednesday practice. We were, we were uh, going over scout O and defensively we were catching interceptions and guys were catching it and only running five or six yards and then throwing the ball back to the offense. Okay. We did that the entire day. We probably had like seven or eight interceptions as a team, but we wasn't really returning it. So the next day, which was, I think, that Thursday practice, Mike Tomlin and Dick LeBeau talked about it. And I know Dick LeBeau emphasized, he's like, guys, what are we doing? This is not how you practice. This is not a winning practice rep. He said, from now on, when guys catch an interception, I understand we're not live. We only had helmets and shells on. I want you to run like you're trying to score. And for the guys, that are on the field with you, I want you to block like this is the last play of our life. Instantly, it triggered in their mind like, yeah, we're tripping. We're being lackadaisical. Mm -hmm. So that day of practice, anytime we catch a pass, it don't matter where you was at, we're running. And you saw 10 guys trying to get in the camera, the camera view, so <laughs> coach can see us hustling to try to find a body to block. To block. That's why practice and repetitions are so important especially practicing good habits because those habits right. will be called on. And guess what? In that play, when James Harrison caught that football, you saw 10 guys hustling, trying to get into the camera and trying to find someone to block, similar to what we did in practice. And that's why I'm like, man, good coaching is so important yeah. because if they don't pinpoint how lackadaisical we were the day before, we probably would have did the same thing. That's, that's wild. I hadn't heard that story before, but that's... Yes. So there you go. Practice like you play. I mean, that's that's a case in point right there. So we push down the line now. Three minutes left in the ball game. You're up 2014, uh, but there's the holding call in the end zone. I think on Justin Hartwig, it's 2016. You got to give him the ball back. Backed up. And, and and then bang, Warner to Fitz, 64 yards. I remember as a fan, your heart sinks. You go, oh my god, I can't believe this. They're down. There's less than three minutes left. How did guys on the sideline react to that moment? Because again, we talk about calling on your past experience, uh, a first time Super Bowl team, guys may look around and go, oh my God, I can't believe that happened. But I get the feeling and correct me if I'm wrong. There's probably a lot of dudes that look around at each other on the sideline and say, it's all right. We got 247 left. We're good. Yeah. We were just so disappointed that we gave up that huge play because remember in 08, we did a great job in not allowing big plays, splash plays. That's something that we didn't do. And we gave up that play with like, freak. we played so well the entire season and we gave up the play that could hurt us and win another championship. Um, but that's the good part about being a, being a part of a real good team. You know, sometimes the other side got to go up and help us out, right? And that's what our offense did. Like, Fitz scored that touchdown. I never seen Fitzgerald run that fast in my life, <laughs> number one. <laughs> <laughs> it's just like, it's like, who is in his body? Because that man was running. No one was catching him. Like, and Fitzgerald was never known to be a burner. No. But when he caught that pass, he's gone. It's a wrap. He wanted it that bad. And for us, we're like, Ugh. but then the ebbs and flows of ball games. We came mm -hmm. to the sideline. I remember my offense saying, don't worry, we got it. And I'm not going to lie to you, Chris, I did not believe they were not going to get in scoring position. I felt like 
this is what seven does mm -hmm. in our offense, even though defensively everybody was talking about all the gaudy numbers we were doing, we knew our right. offense can deliver because we had a quarterback that did not blink. And San Antonio, that drive, he earned it. When that play happens in the end zone, are you watching it on the scoreboard? Or Side are you line. trying? Oh, I was watching the field view. So when you see it happen, is your first reaction, oh, Tone got his toes down? Or oh, is yeah. It, yeah. 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 I, I knew it. Right Tone away. was great at that toe tap. He was great at that toe tap. I just, my concern was the review booth, making mm -hmm. sure they don't get it wrong. Cause you know, time is sometimes in the game of football, you see what happened and the review booth see something totally different. And you're like, what the right. freak were you looking at? Ask right? Jesse James about that, right? Um, facts, facts. Don't don't re don't remind our Steelers fans about <laughs> sorry, that. Play, sorry, sorry. Sensitive moment. We're talking yeah. about good stuff. We're talking about 2008. Yeah. So when you look back on that game now, when you look back on that postseason, that year, that group of guys, what sticks out to you the most? Like, what are some of the first memories that bubble back to the surface? Greatness, just being a part of greatness. Mm -hmm. uh, greatness for a few different reasons. Here's here's why I use that word greatness. Because we were the first team to win six Lombards in the National Football League ever. The game of the NFL has been around for uh, what? 50 plus years now? What? We've, long, uh, long, yeah, longer than that. About Super, 60 Super, over six. Super Bowl's been around almost 60 years. NFL's been around almost 100 now. Yeah. So in the Super Bowl era over 60 years, in the NFL era over 100, about 100, we were the first team to win six Lombardies. Mm -hmm. So for us to accomplish that, something that no one can ever take away from us. And we will always be in that legacy conversation as an organization started with the guys in the seventies that built the blueprint that created the foundation greatness. We added to that. Then secondly, just dominance for me, greatness and dominance. That's what we displayed on our defensive side. That's what we displayed dominance for the, the entire season. Um, Actually, our worst game was the playoff game. I mean, the Super Bowl game, kind of. You know what I mean? That and the, maybe the Tennessee Titan game. Right. You know what I mean? But luckily enough for us, we had an offense that was, that was ready as well. So just to be a part of that, man, we don't get talked about enough. I think I'll say this, Chris, and I'm glad you had me on this because I want to highlight this, that people need to realize, not just mm -hmm. Pittsburgh Steelers-based folks, but folks that love the game of football. Those two Super Bowl teams that we, I was a part of and 05 and 08 we don't get talked about enough and we should mm -hmm. the reason why i say that is because i just highlight to i just highlighted to you why the 08 super bowl team should be talked about more defensively as one of the best defenses in the national football league with the numbers proves that right when it's six lombardi's the first ever to do that ain't too many other organizations going to do that you can add another hundred years there's not going to be a lot of organizations in that conversation that say hey we got six super bowls right then if you go back to the 05 Super Bowl run, the way we did what we did. Remember at that time, when you're the first to do something, that's greatness, right? We were the first team to be a six seed to win a Super right. Bowl. That never happened before until we did it. And then eventually the Giants repeated that as well. But we were the first team to do that on the road. Played against Cincinnati with an outstanding offense. Then you played against Peyton Manning. Then we played against uh, uh, Denver, then we played against Seattle. In our Super Bowl run, we played against the top four offenses in the National Football League. <laughs> against the offensive MVP and Sean Alexander as well. Right. Think about that. Then think about this. Think about the notable legends that were a part of our Super Bowl team in 05 that are already in the Hall of Fame. Mr. Rooney, right? Mm -hmm. God bless the dead. Where is he? Hall of Fame, right? Bill Cowher, where is he? Hall of Fame. Dick LeBeau, where is he? Hall of Fame. Russ Grimm, where is he? Hall of Fame. Jerome Bettis, where is he? Hall of Fame. <laughs> Troy Palomalu, where is he? Hall of Fame. Eventually, Ben is going to get in. I'm missing another mm -hmm. player. That's six. Hines. Uh -huh. Hines will get in as well. I'm talking about it's already in. I think it's seven that's already in. I said, Mr. Rooney. Yep. Bill. Dick, Russ, Jerome, Troy. Mm. There's another that's already in the hall as well. Alan Fanica. There we go. Thank you. So think about this for everyone that's watching us. For our Super Bowl to be, what, 
20 years, almost well, 15, what, years, now, 15 yeah. years ago, right? Or, or 05. 05. For that team yeah. to already have seven members that's currently in the Hall of Fame. And the majority of these guys were first ballots. It's not like we were a Super Bowl team that won in the 80s where right. you had years and years and years to, for guys to get in. Heck, if you think about some of the Super Bowl winners before us, I don't think that Baltimore Raven 2000 Super Bowl team got seven people already in the hall. Nope. I don't think that uh, New England Patriot 04 team got seven people in the hall. I don't think uh, uh, you look at the Rams when they won their Super Bowl against the Tennessee Titans. They ain't got seven people in the hall. Nope. Hey, if you want to go back to some of the 49ers Super Bowl runs with Joe Montana and Steve Young, I don't know if they got seven people that were a part of that team in the hall. No, probably no, probably not even. And they might, but I, I, it just it doesn't jump jump off the top right. of my head. So for us to be a Super Bowl team that clearly is not forty or fifty years ago, twenty or uh, thirty years ago, for us to already have seven in the Hall of Fame, and then eventually Ben is getting in. That would be eight. Eventually, James Harrison is going to get in. That would be nine. Eventually, Hines should get in. That would be ten. Hmm. That doesn't get talked That's- about enough. Now, it's a wild amount of talent all, all brought together. I was going to throw one more thing at you. What you got? Um, I, I had no idea until I looked this up this morning. Teams that have been no- – defenses that have been number one in both points against and yards against in the same season. The Steelers, you think of the vaunted steel curtain defense, right? They only did that once in the 70s. It was 1976. They didn't even win a Super Bowl that year. The other three times they've done it, all Dick LeBeau teams – Two of them you were a part of, and we just got done talking about one of them. 2004, you mentioned that, the the year they lose to the Patriots in the AFC Championship game. You joined the team a year later. 2011, a couple years after Super Bowl 43, but you were a part of that one as well. And 2008, the year we just got done talking about. So three of of the four times the Pittsburgh Steelers have had the number one ranked defense in both points and yards against, led by Dick LeBeau, and really the same core of guys at the center of all of it, Harrison, Paul Amalu, McFadden, uh, so many, Ryan Clark, so many of the guys, Farrier for, for most of those years, it, are, are there and a part of it. And the culture that was built around that defense, around that team that you talked about earlier, uh, the camaraderie that gets built by being there to help lift the young guys up and the veterans oversee the whole thing, the leadership that goes into all of that. How many people from that time frame, I know you were at at camp this summer, spending a a little bit of time there, and you still come back to Pittsburgh when you can make time, but how many of the people associated with that group, specifically 2008, do you still keep in touch with, and do you guys talk about this often? Oh, a a lot. (laughs) Man, we got a group chat with about 17, 20 guys. (laughs) <laughs> man we were a group that really liked each other i'm sorry not like we loved each other yo we didn't tolerate each other because we were teammates but man we really ride we rode with each other man so we talk about we 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 don't talk about that a lot but we just we 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 just we just we get together unfortunately we had a teammate that passed in clark Hagens. um he you know they had the funeral arrangements a few weeks ago and there were a lot of us that went out to uh pay our respects to Clark and it was probably about 20 of us you know what I mean that was associated with Clark during his Steeler days and some of his collegiate teammates was out there as well and just the pouring of love and respect that we all had for him while he was here we wanted to do the same thing with him you know leaving um and we just went back down memory lane man we got some memories man we got some real good memories that are PG-13 and rated R, but it's all <laughs> memories that we would never forget. And you talked about how many, I talked, I talk, we talk all the time. That, that's why our group was so special. You know, Chris, oftentimes, not just in sports, but just as an adult, when you are part of an employer, when you, when you have an employment opportunity and you're an employee and you work with a company, oftentimes when you leave that said employer, you really don't talk to a lot of people who you used to work with. Right. But when you got a, 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 a diehard, legit relationship with the folks that were in the building, even though you're no longer associated with that brand, when there's a mutual love from both sides, you're still going to communicate. You're still going to check up on each other. That's what we do. Because it wasn't just about, I rock with you because we were all for the Steelers. No, I rock with you because, man, I love you. 
that's the bond that we built. That's why it made winning so easy for us. That's why we won so much because number one, we loved each other and we trust that that person next to me is going to be where he needs to be. And if he was not where he need to be, needed to be, it's okay. And me telling him, get in line. And he don't get sensitive. Right. You know what I mean? Oh, man, why are you coming at me like this? No, I wasn't. You're right, bro. I'm tripping. I am tripping. When a coach said, man, what are you doing? Why are you? You're right. I'm tripping. We didn't have guys like, man, y'all tripping. And I ain't tripping. No, everyone looked themselves in the mirror because we knew what we needed to do and what was expected for us to get to where we got. It, winning for us, it was easy. It wasn't hard. Yeah, that, account, we, that accountability is, is so key. Major. And, and when, when the coaches don't have to be the only people holding up that sense of accountability when the players do it for each other, you're right. That's amazing. Uh, and I can't believe 10, 15, 20 years later, you're all still in touch with each other. That's fantastic to hear. This has been wonderful spending time with you, BMAC. I really do appreciate it. Looking forward to doing this series throughout the season to reacquaint people with some of those memories that we all have of the 2008 Pittsburgh Steelers. Big Nasty D that won Super Bowl 43. Uh, thanks again for making the time, man. I appreciate it. Thank you, Chris, for having me, man. I hope everyone enjoyed this. Absolutely. Definitely a joy to have BMAC anytime you can get a chance to speak with him and his recollections of 2008 and 2005. Before that, those huge plays as a rookie against the Indianapolis Colts in the divisional round. And then again, the run in 2008 under Mike Tomlin to the franchise's sixth Super Bowl title. Great stories from him. Next week, Larry Foote joins us, another guy who was there during the transitional period from Bill Cowher to Mike Tomlin, part of both the Super Bowl 40 and Super Bowl 43 teams. We will focus with Larry Foote, now a coach for the Tampa Bay Buccaneers, one of their co-defensive coordinators, actually. We'll talk to Larry Foote next week. Be sure, if you have not already, click the little notification bell if you're watching this on YouTube down below to get notified as soon as new videos are, are posted to the 93.7 The Fan YouTube page. And of course, come on back to the Odyssey app, the 93.7thefan.com. Every Thursday, we will have new episodes of Oh Mama, a look back at the 2008 Steel Curtain Defense, brought to you by South Hills Kia.